Hello and welcome to Bristol Sport TV. Well, as the global pandemic of coronavirus continues to impact our world, we're bringing you news from across our sporting group, uh, getting in touch with our players, our staff and our coaches to find out how they are surviving life in lockdown, albeit as some of the measures are just starting to ease. And today I'm pleased to say that I'm joined not by one, but by two Garys. I'm joined by Gary Probert, who is Bristol City's Academy Manager, and Gary Townsend, who shall be referred to as GD GT throughout the whole of this interview. Uh, GT is the Bears Academy Junior Manager. Uh, welcome both of you. Great to have you both here. Morning, Lisa. Morning, Gary. Morning. Thanks for having us. Nice to see you both. Uh, no, it's great. It's great to have a bit of insight uh, into what our academies are up to, because I know you guys have both both been furiously busy throughout this time. Uh, Gary Probert, if we just start with you first, uh, just give us a bit of an insight into the structure of the academy, because I know both football and rugby are, are set up pretty differently. Yeah, it's certainly been a, a strange time for, for the staff and the players. So uh, in a nutshell, our structure is we have um, under nines to under 23s, um, which are all signed players. So as a signed player, they just play for Bristol City. They don't play for any other clubs. They train with us a minimum of three times a week, which which gradually increases as they get a little bit older. Um, we do have a, an under sevens, under eights, a pre-academy structure where those boys continue to play for their grassroots teams um, and they will slowly but surely feed into the academy system uh, and the boys are all obviously in school so they're all in school like any other young person they come in with us typically two evenings a week and then a saturday morning and they have a games program on a sunday when they reach the end of their gcse's so as they turn 16 that's then when we make decisions on the players if they come in full time or not so those boys we refer to as scholars so like an old apprenticeship in old money so they will come in for two years for their under 17 under 18 year where they're in with us full time so they're in with us monday to saturday generally they do full-time education with us they obviously do football they do their gym they do analysis they do psychology they have a rounded program and then they play games on a saturday uh, morning or saturday lunchtime and then the next step from there is going into our under 23s, which are based next to our first team at Feyland. And they are then full-time professionals. So they will range between sort of 18 and, and 21, 22 years of age. And that's the boys that people will probably heard more about that are training around the first team, maybe playing some loan um, games for, for loan clubs and hopefully getting closer to the first team. Yeah, so that's a whole player pathway almost from under nines right the way through to the elite level of the sport. And I think it's it's almost around nearly 200 odd players, I think, or, or boys that you're involved with uh, in that setup. Uh, GT, the Bears Academy set up pretty differently. Uh, you, you have a, a responsibility for the junior side and obviously there's a senior side as well. So just talk us through that. OK, well, it's, um, yeah, very, very different to football. So um, we're not allowed to engage with the boys until under 13. Um, it's a late specialisation sport. So across the board, we have about the 1,100 boys on the programme aged 13 to 16. Uh, we train the majority of them once a week. We see them every week, uh, once a week for around about an hour. Um, but the best of the best get um, promoted, for want of a better word, to the... The next stage where we see them twice a week for uh, four hours a week but that can't happen until they're under 15 so for the first two years it's purely development uh, it's purely embedding them in the in the bears way and what we're about and then from under 15 to 16 we start to play representative rugby which will be county rugby or academy rugby uh, under 15 and 16 but we're only talking about half a dozen games in each of those age groups and then at the end of the under-16 season, that gets really narrowed down to under-18s. And the under-18s, under-17s, 18s will take on about 45 to 50 boys and develop them further. But the, the important message really is that the door is always open and that we're continually changing because it's a late specialisation sport and because boys develop at different rates uh, and it is a physical sport as well, that that door has to be open. So 
We have boys currently playing our under 18s who really didn't feature that much at under 15 and 16, um, but have come through because of their physical development. That's why we have to have as broad a program as we as we do. And we're under the um, we're under the management of Pat Lamb directly. He takes a real interest in what we do. Uh, we meet with him uh, once or twice a month. Uh, Gethin Watts is a senior academy manager, quite unique uh, as rugby academies go in that we we have two bespoke purposes. Ours, ours is to unlock potential. And Gethin's uh, remit is to develop them into a high performance environment. It's interesting you talk there about the Bears way and instilling in them, perhaps from the junior uh, development point, it's almost more a focus on on developing them as young people and instilling them with characteristics that you want them to have growing up, whether or not they continue to play for the Bears or, or not. Yeah, totally. You know, character is massive for us. It, uh, it's a... Uh, We'll, we'll talk in point and the boys have to recite a, a mantra. We have three sentences which they have to be able to recite in order to be given their, their Bears t-shirts and we reference that a, a lot of the time. It, you, you know what we, one of the things that this uh, this crisis has brought is that there's far more communication on Facebook and I was really heartened to see the other day that two of our former academy boys, one has just been named as uh, junior of the year for his local rugby club, which is Avonmouth. Uh, that was Finn Dolan, and then Dominic Sprague, who was uh, um, through it in our academy all the way through 13 to 18, is young player of the year for old, old Red Cliffian. So, you know, for us, we're as proud of that as we are about them making a uh, professional rugby because the vast majority of our players, 99.9%, .9 will return to their clubs. It's important to us that they return to their clubs far far better rugby players but also really good people as well um so yeah we're as proud of that as we are about uh, uh people getting into our or young players getting into our uh, into our senior academy and into our uh, first team yeah, it, it's interesting looking at it from a, from a sporting group point of view as well. I can definitely see there is a, a common ground as much as the two sports, football and rugby are so different and, and in their approaches different. Um, there is a commonality, though, in terms of that head coach leadership, you know, director of rugby in Pat Lamb and head coach with Lee um, of instilling that right the way down through. Because I, I know that that's not normal in, in both of, of your sports um, acro across the country. There isn't always quite that close contact uh, between, say, the very head first team uh, coaches right the way down to the under 13. Yeah, like, like you've said, and similar to what Gary said with Pat, we're really fortunate with Lee and his, and his team of staff that they genuinely are interested and they genuinely do care. And it makes our job as an academy so much easier that you're pushing at an open door with first team staff and a head coach that will happily invite players to train with his team if they're you know, where they need to be that knows the boys' names, that can watch a video clip and know who that player is. Um, and that's why getting onto this, the, the site together w when it's ready will be huge for us to have all that informal interaction every day. Um, at the moment with the split sites, we, it happens, but you have to work hard to make it happen. And th the site where we're all together every day will just make it so much more natural to have those corridor conversations, those conversations over a canteen, lunch, or on the side of a pitch when the under-14s are training will just make it so much more natural. Um, so we're really excited about that bit as well. Yeah, because of course you're, you're based up at SGS to the north of the city in Filton. Um, of course, when the new training ground comes on site, you guys will move down and be alongside. And I guess for the for the youngsters as well, that is huge to be able to be seeing that that, that player pathway genuinely, that it does go hand in hand. And I guess, I guess also there is the fact that our coaches actually are a very young, coaching team so actually all of them have come up through academy structures and and some of them have got sons obviously i'm, I'm thinking of jamie mccallister's son <laughs> tommy rowe obviously his son involved um, you know pat mountain the goalkeeping coach he's been involved in academies they've all had that experience and not too long ago so they they probably get more than most the importance of, of the academy's part within the overall club absolutely um and they as you've said, they've all had an involvement in academies, some of them with ours, some of them with other academies. So they absolutely understand and have empathy with what an academy and what a young player's development journey looks like. 
that if you go and watch our under-14s, hopefully you'll see some really good things, but you will see some things where they're 13-year-old boys that are growing, that are trying to learn to make decisions, they'll make mistakes, we'll give goals away, we'll miss chances because they're young people. Uh, but they get that because they're fathers, they have worked with players of that age, they've seen the development uh, curve, if you like, with, with players at this club and other clubs. So it really makes those conversations easier when you're talking about talking about players or talking about development plans or trying to link up a player's next part of their journey, that those people that are really key decision makers and are absolutely key to the young player's journey, that they understand both the person and the process. It's, it's so important. I mean, like I said earlier, we're really lucky to have those people um, helping our academy grow. Yeah. And GT, I mean, you, you touched on in your earlier point there about rugby being that late specialisation sport. I mean, I guess a big difference between football and rugby is, of course, obviously with size, uh, players grow and, and take shape at different sizes. And often with rugby, some of the difficult things you see perhaps in schoolboy rugby is, you know, the big lads suddenly get put into year groups above and actually then don't bring on their skills quite as much because they rely on their size. And a couple of years later, it all evens out. How do you juggle that? Uh, we do a lot of uh, touch or, or um, limited contact in order to give the bigger boys the skills that they will need to be able to compete at the next level. Uh, it, it's odd, actually, that the, the, the smaller lads come in on, on the programme and massively enjoy what they're doing because they're, all their skills are, are shown off. The bigger lads struggle a little bit because, actually, we're trying to give them the skills that they haven't quite got yet because they've... They've dominated through their size. They've dominated their local uh, rugby club. They've dominated the school. Um, so we try and, and uh, give them the skills to be able to compete at the next level because when they play county rugby, when they play academy rugby, they will be playing against players as big, if not bigger than themselves, with more skills. So, yeah, we it's, it's, as I say, very, very much a uh, skills-based programme. I will, if I may, come back to something Gary said about luck, about lucky to have people. I, 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 Gary, I don't think you are lucky. I think you're like us. It, what you do is you look to recruit and utilise good people within your programmes. I, I kept saying, you know, we're lucky to be working with these coaches. We, we, well, we, we, we are in a way, but we're not because that's our strategy. Our strategy to is employ and deploy really, really good people who get it who care about what they're doing, who care about the young people under their care and care about our, our vision and what we're trying to do. So, yeah, I say, again, you know, I can see the luck side of it, but I also think, you know, give yourself a pat on the back because that's part of your strategy as well. Yeah, there you go, Gary, give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, it does, though, it does come from an overall strategy, doesn't it? As you say, GT, that, that is actually right to reference that, that, you know, from the very heart of it, you know, Steve Lansdowne, particularly from, you know, from when I've been involved, he's constantly talked about a sporting group that invests in the future, you know, sustainability, developing grassroots and roots. And the, the academies have always been a, a key part of that refrain. Uh, Gary's right. I think that is a that is a strategy. It is a ploy, and that is something that we are really big on. Is 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 people, and it's it, not just the players, but for staff as well. I think it's so important that you have people. Yes, they need a technical competence, but you know we can help them with that. We can support their development in those areas. But it's really hard to to change people's personality and to make them care. And I'm I'm really fortunate that our staff absolutely care about our young people and go above and beyond to help develop them as young people and as and as young footballers. Mm. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? At a time of crisis is a time really where you see leaders step up, um, people take charge, but also sometimes the people that come through that you hadn't actually perhaps necessarily even noticed or, or clocked before, the people that have come through to volunteer and help through this crisis has been has been astounding. And I know, GT, I mean, obviously the Bears have been involved in a lot of the community fundraising. We saw Craig Capel doing his 2.6 challenge, um, the involvement with the food banks across the group, obviously the food effort here from Ashton Gate. But that that stepping up and that that going going a bit above and beyond. I know that I've heard personal stories of some of the young lads be, being astounded that they've had so much contact from yourself, from your team, 
Um, just on daily updates, give us a bit of insight into stuff that's been going on. Because I know one of the players that I spoke to, one of the young lads um, in the, I think he was in the under 16s, just said, you know, we've been getting recipes every week. Yeah, it's really important. You know, about my background's development, and I, I used to be a, a PE teacher, but also a head of year. So the pastoral side of things is really important to, to me. Uh, and, and the crisis has come, and, and for some of these young people, it's. Um, yeah, they're missing a lot. You know, I had an email the other day from one of the boys. He's with um, City of Bristol uh, Swimming Academy, and he, he normally trains 18 hours a week. And that's gone down to, I wouldn't say it's gone down to zero because they, they've done a really good job of keeping in, in touch with him. But we've got other boys who are uh, like black belts in karate. We've got other boys in, uh, in county uh, cricket. Uh, there, there must be boys uh, itching to do athletics over the summer, and that's not going to happen. So that has a, a huge impact on them as, uh, as young people and on their families as well. So we've adopted a strategy of, uh, first of all, not flooding them with too much stuff because um, there, there's a danger that that becomes a white noise. So the strategy is to contact them uh, twice a week, all of them, all 1,100 boys, um, and to provide so, yeah, some rugby tasks, so some strength and conditioning and some skills stuff. And the under 15s have produced a video, which is brilliant, of them doing skills in the garden. But also um, some stuff around um, diet. So they've had a go at cooking. And I, I've been absolutely blown away with the fact that they, they, you know, the kids have been sending me um, photographs of their, their cooking exploits, which has been great. So it looks, hopefully it looks, um, it looks good and tastes good. So I found out about a lot about these boys that I wouldn't normally know. So they, you know, a couple of the kids, uh, Nat Ring, for example, has done 10K for seven days. Every, every day he's done 10K for seven days and raised a thousand pound for charity. Emil Mendes, an under-16 boy, so he's he's built a pizza um, oven in the back garden, which is brilliant stuff. He's sent me clips of that um, almost every day, which I really enjoy watching. It's a range of stuff, not just about rugby, but about them as young people and, and about them as part of the Bears family. Uh, and Whereas I thought it would be almost a one-way thing, it's actually been a two-way thing and um, loads of parents have been in touch and told me about the competitions that they got going in their guard. But we will, we will have the fittest group of parents in, in the academy yeah. structure. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, there's a lot of parents getting involved in the in the daily classes. I know I, I speak from home. You talk about City of Bristol and the swimming side of it. There's a lot of Zoom coaches and, and people doing the Joe Wicks challenge in the morning. Um, Gary, I, I guess for you, I, I heard you chuckling there in the background. I mean, it's, it's very similar, isn't it? For once, social media, which traditionally has had some negative connotations to it, actually has come into its own. And of course, this this young demographic that we've got are so, so naturally used to using it that they've they've come into their own yes it's, I, was, I was laughing at the parents getting fitter because we had some feedback about that i think the parents trying to keep up with the boys doing uh, their activity uh, i agree about the technology i think similar to what gary said we've learned so much about some of our players around their you know who they live with what you know what their situation is like what their circumstances like and obviously there's huge difference between our our demographic of, of young people that we've got in the academy it's quite funny when when we first started this process um sort of five six weeks ago when we were doing like the zoom calls and, and like the squad zoom calls the kids are on there absolutely know how to work their, work their way around it the staff are still not put themselves on mute and pressing the wrong button so the kids absolutely are much slicker than, than we were at the time um yeah it has it has been a challenge um to keep in touch with all of them um in the same way so i think we've definitely had to adapt you know some have access to laptops internet can get on a zoom call really easily some can't so we've got to find a different way to communicate with those boys some have a garden or access to an open space where they could do some of the task we were sending some don't so we have we have to adapt and i think that's probably been one of our biggest learnings of, of really almost challenging ourselves how well do we really know the boys and their, and their circumstances and and as much as there's been a lot of negative about the lockdown period it has enabled us to do that and i think the staff have done a wonderful job of, of getting to know the boys and what's going on for them and and how they're feeling because 
some some of the boys have been fine and, and like us as adults some have found it really tough and, and I think the biggest thing we can do is is just to be there to support them during this really really bizarre period. Well GT you talk about contact time there and how important it's been uh, staying in touch with the kids I guess the one of the differences as well is for, from a rugby point of view of course uh, across all sports and organisations uh, people have made use of the government ret job retention scheme but within the Bears Academy you guys have haven't been furloughed and and that's made such a big difference. Yeah I mean it's credit to um, uh, to the Landstand and to Pat really and, and, and their commitment to the community so the vast majority of our staff have been furloughed including players um, but there's been a strategy to keep the heads of department um, unfurloughed. It was one of my, my major concerns really was that um, above everything else that I would be furloughed and from a pastoral point of view I didn't think it would be the right thing but I didn't need to, to worry because both Pat and, and as I say John Lansdowne and Steve have supported that and um, because I'm not furloughed I'm able to maintain that contact with the, the, the boys and their families we, we've given them a degree of normality if you like um, I've been able to do other work as well and planning for next season and planning contingencies as well, um, just in case this thing goes on. So uh, I give huge, huge credit to to um, Pat, uh, the Landstones, for their commitment to not just the academy, to, but to our wider community, really. Yeah, and you, and you talk about that commitment to the community. I guess, Gary, it's the same for you guys as well, because it isn't just about, you know, that contact of developing them as players, but actually that staying in touch from a social and mental health well-being. It's, it's the same, same has been seen within the City Academy. Academy. Yeah, I think GT summed that up really well. It would be absolutely the same same for us. The support of the Lansdowne family, um, Mark Ashton and the board of directors has enabled us to keep a core staff in base to do exactly as, as GT's described really well because the, the, the real worry through this time isn't football, isn't their physical fitness, it's purely staying in touch and their mental well-being and their emotional well-being and without having a, the team of staff still working that working as, as hard and as and as well as they are we wouldn't be able to stay in touch with with that number of players so that that support we're, we're really grateful for hmm. you both um have referenced the importance of your sports within the community and i know that you guys that do a lot of work within the community and i'm, I'm almost thinking you know of those big moments that the community the bristol community comes together like the balloon fiesta i know i know gary you guys have been up to the balloon fiesta a few times and it's 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 so heartening to see that that next stage and those youth in that youth involvement <laughs> It's, it's been brilliant. It's been a great event and the, we, we've taken the under 23 players, under 18 players and they absolutely, they love it. I think they love it because people ask for their autograph and they don't really know who they are. So it's their first time they've ever been asked for an autograph. But I think they just love the impact they can have with young people, that they play a football match, or they do a few sort of skills or techniques with them. Um, and I think it starts to really sort of show the boys how privileged they are to be where they are as well it's been a really 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 positive part to our program having more and more community involvement for for the scholars the under 23 and for the staff it's been really good yeah and I guess as you say it gives them their first sort of touch or glimpse of what it's like to have that sort of first team celebrity that but but it's also about making them keep their feet on the ground and I guess I, I guess someone that embodies that kind of humbleness is someone like Corey Smith exactly I mean Corey Corey is, is a real role model for all of our young people, not just for his level of football and, and the things he's achieved and continues to achieve in the game, but for how he is as a, as a person. I mean, he's given his time over the last week to speak to all of our schoolboy players on Zoom calls to give them an insight into what lockdown is like for him. And it's been a real comfort for the players that it's not much different to what they're doing. Um, so even a professional footballer, that captains our team is still going through some of the issues that they're going through has been a real comfort. Um, some of the physical work he's doing, um, they've also had lots of questions about high points in his career, clearly the, the famous goal against Manchester United, how he deals with low points, how he deals with injuries, when did he come into the professional game. It's been a, it's been a real insight into both the life of a professional, but probably more importantly, just the insight into a really good person and a real good role model that the boys really aspire to be like. So we're really grateful to Corey 
and the other members of the staff and the first team that have helped us out during this period. You both talked about how much more you found out about the players. It could actually put us in a stronger position going forward. Yeah, I think so. I think it will. I definitely think there's a lot more understanding of of the people involved and truly what those people and their circumstances are like. Um, and I think, secondly, the big thing that we're getting from a lot of the boys is is how much they love football. And I think it's quite it can be easy to forget that as much as that sounds silly, but football can become a habit. You like you wake up in the morning, you go to school, you do your learning, you come home, you might do a quick bit of homework, you come to football, you train, you go home, you eat, you go to bed. And I think where our boys are in the system for such a long period of time, if they come into the system at eight, and by the time they finish their scholarship, they could have been in for 10 years. And there's some real positives to that. But there, there are potentially some trade-offs as young people. And I think almost this enforced break has definitely helped to freshen everybody up. And a lot of the boys are now, well, probably all of the boys, are chomping at the bit that they've really missed football. So, And I think that's been a good thing. You know, it has given them a definite break because whenever we have summer breaks, they're all still out playing football. <laughs> so they're just playing football on a different pitch, you know, with their own T-shirt on rather than a Bristol City T-shirt. Um, so it's yeah. definitely refreshed everybody and I think made everybody really, really uh, eager to get back into some form of football again. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, Gary. I mean, GT, you must have you find the same. It's it's about almost rediscovering the love of a sport because sometimes, like anyone, you know, you, you reference swimming, you know, and the amount of hours that you spend in a pool, uh, you know, staring at a black line, dot dot dot, and turn. Um, it is easy for so many people to, when they're in that system for a long time, to fall out of love with it. But actually, you know, when you take something away, you often realise quite how much you miss it. Totally agree with you, Gary. On this is that. Uh, it will, it is every day, it does become a habit. Those boys are chomping at the bit. And what I'm hoping happens is that when they play, they savour every single moment that they play um, and enjoy what they are doing. Enjoy the moment. Um, rather than looking too far ahead, enjoy their involvement and their inclusion in, in, uh, in, our programs uh, and look at how fortunate they are to be in that position that loads of other kids will give their right arm to be in. Yeah. Um, that's what I hope and that's what I believe will come from this. You know, my own experiences, I, I, I um, was prevented from playing for 10 years, I had a nasty neck injury and stuff. And then I did come back and play and, and I, I savoured every single second of every game that I played because I didn't think I was going to play again. And I'm hoping yeah. that those boys get get the same the same level of enjoyment that certainly I, I've got or I had. Yeah. Well, guys, it's been uh, fascinating to talk to you. Thanks so much for coming on the programme and uh, stay safe and well. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much, Lisa. Good no to see you, nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. Catch up soon. Well, that's it from Bristol Sport TV for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the insight into our youth academy setups. And perhaps as both of the Garys referenced, if we can take one small positive away from this crisis, it is that we could all perhaps fall in love with sport once again. That's it from me. Take care, stay safe, stay well. <laughs>